Silk embroidery was first introduced to the Métis in the Red River Settlement in 1844 with the establishment of the Grey Nuns Convent and Mission School. At the Mission School, Métis girls were given a basic education and were trained in a variety of domestic skills, including needlework or fancy work, as it was known at the time. Here, Métis students were introduced to silk thread and a variety of new techniques, ideas, and designs. Silk embroidery as an art form was quickly adopted by Métis women and girls. It was used to decorate their personal and household items, their clothing, and the clothing of their loved ones. Shortly after the establishment of the Grey Nuns Convent at Red River, the order spread north and west into the interior, establishing mission schools across the Métis homeland. This influence helped spread the art of silk embroidery, as did the major dispersals of Métis families from Manitoba and Saskatchewan following the 1869-70 and 1885 resistances. Away from the schools, many Métis women continued to practice the art of silk embroidery, experimenting with styles, designs and colours. As a result, the Métis developed a unique artistic tradition. Mark Harrison, originally from a Métis road allowance community in the Quapel Valley, remembers people in the community wearing clothing which was decorated with embroidery. They just dressed up in special occasions, I think, and the shawls that I remember seeing, um, I saw different decorating on their, you know, on their lapels, say, or um, on their cuffs. The ladies would do collars. Um, and I don't remember that many decorative sh shawls, really. Um, but um, I think because there was such a, you know, they were so poor in that region that they really didn't uh, get into it so much. Everybody was always working, you know, like that was their thing, working from, from dusk till dawn, and the women were working just as hard as the men, so, and bringing up their children with, uh, you know, their, very poor people in the re in the valley, uh, so I didn't really see too much um, too much in shawls. Uh, I don't even remember seeing so much buckskin with uh, you know with a lot of embroidery on. So um, they weren't that um, decorative there, I guess. You know, mind you, in the valley, I was 10 years old when I uh, when we left the valley. So you know. When you're up until you're 10, you don't really notice all of those kind of things. Uh, so, but mother said that they did do them, and uh, everybody was, you know, really interested in always embellishing new things. Mm -hmm. I don't remember them doing moccasins. I can't, uh, you know, I can't say that they they did moccasins. They did mostly things that they used in the home, like pillowcases and tea cloths and uh, maybe bedspreads or something like that. But they did a lot of blanket making. Uh, uh, of course, everything was homemade, so whatever materials they had, sometimes material was hard to, you know, to come by. But um, Mother always hand-sewed everything, like she made our clothes out of uh, recycled material. Uh, clothes are uh, materials that she got from her farmer friends that, um, that she hooked rugs for. So. Whenever she'd get a jacket, say, or a coat or whatever, she'd revamp it and, and sew it down for us. So she did all her handwork. So, I mean, she was busy doing that. But they used to do this, the ladies. Uh, I know my mother. They used to do pillowcases mostly and tea cloths. And uh, if they got a white blouse, uh, they would just put some embellishment around the collar or in the front, you know, it would be flowers. I love doing flowers. Mark recalls the women in her family spending a great deal of time sewing and decorating clothing and household items. Mark was taught to embroider by her mother, Adeline Pelche de Reset, and was greatly influenced by her grandmother and her mother's sisters. Well, my mother has always done embroidering and um, and I guess we just, all of us, my sister and I, we just automatically would do something, you know, and um, never thought anything of it. Mother always had um, sugar bags and that around. Where she had our favorite, um, our favorite flower pattern, and I think it's up there, um, the 
when Auntie Florence uh, gave me there the one uh, tablecloth up there. It's just a plain simple rose uh, pattern and that's the one that we would try and accomplish. But I, I didn't do a lot of it as as I say, I guess I would give it a try and that would be about it. You know, I wasn't that, that interested at that time. It's became, it was after I got married and, well, I worked on my hope chest, that's right too. I forgot about that. Yeah, I did um, some pillowcases because she said, oh, you have to have this. You have to have that in there, pillowcases and blankets and that kind of thing. So I still, I still do the blankets and I enjoy doing that. But as the years went on, my mother and my, her sisters, um, Auntie Louise and Auntie Florence, for, in, for those two for sure, Auntie Agnes and um, was it Auntie Marie, I believe. Uh, she, they were the ones that were always doing it too. So um, I seen their, I would, when I went to their house and I would see their their pillowcases and I always was attracted to it it was just beautiful and um, one day I just said that mother can you show me how to do this properly and um, we, just, we just got going and that's where it began it just I thought gee I'd like to just continue that then and you know, and show other people that it's a fun, it's a fun art. My one aunt was a, a seamstress. Um, she used to make the uniforms for the RCMP out of Indian Head and Salvation Army uniforms. And she was a busy, busy lady, did alterations, I guess. And so my aunt Florence was the other one. Man, you couldn't keep up to her for sewing. She just fantastic work. She's passed on now so I'm just treasured by the the items that I do have of hers and being able to be you know to be there to watch her do them. Mother now doesn't do um, too much because she's nine, she, well she's 91 and she's still her hands are still really good though because she does sew her own clothes yet but She's not into doing embroidery right now. She said she hasn't got time to sit still. <laughs> and that's always been a dream of mine is to, to show and to make sure that we don't forget it, you know, just um, bring it back. We used to always have dresser scarves on your dresser and it helps keep the dust away. But they did it and they gave it away and, you know, nobody kept any of it. Same with my mother, all the stuff that she did, it just... Well, they did it all for gifts, I guess, say, when they were working with it. And um, it was done specially and that's the beauty of working with thread and uh, sending a message of caring and loving. And you know, when you got a gift of, of embroidery, it was, you know, it's considered very, very honored to, to receive a gift like that. The most common decorative element of Métis silk embroidery is again a floral motif. These floral designs are a carryover from the hide painting and porcupine quill work primarily practiced before the 1850s, but also influenced by the church and the mission schools. The overall floral pattern is constructed of sparsely distributed curving stems, delicate leaves, flower buds and flowers. Flowers were generally embroidered in shades of red and pink with smaller buds in shades of blue and purple. The centers are generally white or a very dark yellow and the leaves are done in shades of green. Today, Métis designs are created much the same way. There's, uh, there's um, 150 or more uh, stitches that a person would learn. So I mean, once you start, you get into it and you, you know, you can can really do some fantastic work. This um, design right here is the uh, uh, one of the main T designs that I like to use uh, because it's all similar to the buttonhole stitch, and it's all done in buttonhole stitch, not just the edging. 
and you can fill in with it, you can outline with it. So I mean, it's a very versatile stitch. Once you get it, you can you know really move it into a whole uh, new area. Uh, the other one, this is a fill-in stitch here. This this one here is a um, a fill-in, but it doesn't have an edge. She's she's went around the entire pattern and then filled it in. But once you get into it, I do have some books here as well that I will show you some different designs. After, as we get into it, we'll, we might want to try something different. But it's always intrigued me uh, once I've seen some of the Meiji designs and, and that I had some sim similar um, stitching that uh, was out there. I was quite surprised when I looked through some of those um, uh, archival um, slides of, of other people's work and uh, I was quite surprised that I was on the right path, I guess, you'd say, with, um, with the Métis designs and I, I didn't even realize that. So it's really nice to see that, you know, that there is a particular design that Métis uh, use a lot of, and that's the, and this is the blanket stitch that we're doing right now. This is not going to be a lost art. <laughs> we have got it going here. And that's always been a dream of mine is to, to show and to make sure that we don't forget it, you know, just um, bring it back. I just wanted to show some kind of designs first and then we'll, it might just spur you into a, a new idea. This one here is one that I designed. I like this flower because it's the cross uh, and I like to just have it kind of flary, move out of it, move into uh, leaves. I like a lot of leaves surrounding, surrounding the area and, and then just to finish it off to just sort of close it it in. I like a lot of open air sometimes, but I still like that surrounding area. But that's just one that I, I try to create. Also, I have one right over there that is um, one that I, another idea that I had one day and I thought I better get it down before you forget them, but it's, it's sort of the Métis idea as well, the Métis uh, um, stitch that I'm going to be using on it. In a nutshell, if you want to do your own designing, uh, find your style. See how you can extend from the main flower, how I just came pulling out from it, just to, and that's what the, the designs were. They just pulled away from the one main, main flower, flower and uh, and that's just outlining that one there. That's not our stitch at all there. It's there, it's our design, but it's not. That's just a running stitch or, or, a, or a stem stitch or an outline to the stitch. Down Com below. Yeah, that's a fill in stitch, and okay. it's still not our, the Metis uh, stitch down below either, right. because okay. you'll see there's no ridges. In the past, the embroidery patterns used by Metis girls were mainly floral and commonly drawn by teachers for the girls to copy. Patterns were also copied from church vestments, floral designed European fabrics, or in later years were copied from Victorian magazines and pattern books. Today, embroidery patterns are drawn and applied in numerous ways. Uh, how they started out and how they, um, like if I was to do this rose and then continue on, like I mean the rose could be that big by the time you got done with adding. And that's the circular motion for me is what I like about it. I don't like squares. I like to keep it flowing. And I think that's how some of our, our work is, is it's flowing. And I guess that's why I like the curve. I like doing that curve on there because it's, it's flowing. This one here I, I just designed. I haven't got started yet. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. It's pretty just penciled in. Okay. Yeah, I don't uh, trace any of this, no. It's, yeah, I can't do it the other way. So I have those um, pencils, you know, drawing pencils that I have that are like a charcoal pencil. And they flow very freely on fabric. 
But these will be shawls when I get them done. I want to finish the edges and, uh, and put some uh, beadwork on the edge, like fringe it with beadwork. And um, there's ways to put your pattern on your material, and if you choose um, a cotton, a linen, or uh, any of those kind of materials, there is a transferring method that uh, they have that you can buy now, and it's just iron on onto a white piece of material. And uh, uh, unless you wanted to draw your own, this is something that I uh, designed myself, and it's part of the Métis, I uh, like that circular motion of the Métis designs. So how we um, start out with is we want to find the center of our material. So we fold our material in half and then we fold it again. Okay, so that gives us the exact center of our material. So we just put a little nick there. And, uh, that gives you your center. Okay, so usually what we do in embroidery is we have something in the corners. Uh, we try and have something, this is gonna be a cushion, so you want the focal point to be in the center of the, of the uh, material. So that's the area that you'd be working in. If you were going smaller, well then you would try and have uh, something in the, in the corners, just to complement the center whatever it is you're going to have in there. Be a, ge a geometric design too, where you could have stripes, you know, like it, it's, it just varies. But that's your focal point, your center. Now you know where you're going to begin your flower. Well, usually I start right in the middle and I will make my uh, circle. And then I uh, try and do my petals so that um, the, uh, and, and a lot of times they're, they're not going to all be the same because I, I don't um, care if they are. So uh, I would add on some little things onto that to make it so that it, um, it goes the same, so the petals are the same. Now I'm going to be stitching that, so I'm going to leave it about that wide so that I'm going to be filling in. Then I would move on to the next one and I would make another one coming in here so that you, in this, um, in this design, it's, it's very easy to, to just continue to make the layers. It's continuously layering. And um, when I'm filling in, I'm just, I'm filling in all the way around there. And that sort of brings the flower right together. I'm not leaving any gaps. Some of the, the work that I do, I do some that open air, it's called, so that you're, you're not filling it totally, totally. Some airy. So now we're we're looking at maybe having some um, some curls here, and I like to just um, bring these like this out of this same. Um, I've done one over here, so I'll just maybe continue that kind of theme. Now this side, I want to make this coming this way because um, it will maybe even it out and. Uh, so here we want to add this kind of, it's, it's a leaf and yet it's not because it's, um, so I'm going to be making my circle and I'll end up with maybe three colors in that one. And this is how we used to do it, just layering and to, you know, bring that. And so that would be green. You'd fill it in and fix it up as you go along. It gives you an idea that that uh, freehand is actually fun to do. And the tracing, of course, you can trace too. So I think I'll just leave that like that for now, and it gives me a starting point. I'll start filling this in and start moving out, and then I may think of something else that I want to, you know, I want to add something down here. This is uh, a hoop, and it has this little adjustment on there. So once you get that put underneath, then you will put that on top and then you will pound it right down and tighten that little screw there. And there is nowadays so many nice transfers out there. Beautiful stenciling you could do.
Different types of fabrics may be used for embroidery. However, good quality, closely woven fabrics such as linen, cotton and wool are preferred. Mainty women, often without much disposable income for purchasing fabrics, used any and all available fabrics for embroidery. For instance, in the past, Métis women used fabric bags that sugar was purchased in. These sugar bags were normally a closely woven, light-colored cotton fabric, ideal for making tablecloths, tea cloths, and pillowcases. I just wanted to show this yeah. is um, a sugar bag material, and that's what they used to make their, their um, tablecloths, pillowcases, underclothes were made with this, and that's the authentic sugar bag. Oh my goodness. And this is very nice to embroidery with. I think I started with silk, actually, because I love the feel of it and, uh, you know, and uh, it, it gets tangled because it's so thin, but once you get the rhythm to it, then you, you just don't notice it, you know. And you have to find the good material, too. And, you know, you want to have a material that's going to last for years and years, so you have to get a good material. So I chose this linen. It's a linen, and I think it has a bit of polyester in it, but linen, I find, is very soft, and it'll hold the, the threads in there for, you know, a long time. Silk thread was first made available to Métis students at boarding and residential schools. It could be purchased in a variety of colors and was immensely popular among Métis women who favored it for its sheen and durability. Silk thread was also color fast, meaning that the colorful floral designs Métis women created would not fade. Into the early 1900s, the cost of silk production in China, Japan, India and Italy continued to rise, making silk thread virtually unavailable to many Métis women. Therefore, many were forced into using the substandard cotton embroidery floss in the place of silk. In 1924, an artificial silk called rayon was first produced. And although better than the cotton thread, rayon thread was still seen by Métis seamstresses as substandard to the preferred silk thread. I tried to capture it and um, this hasn't even been pressed so it's kind of puffy. but. Um, it, it really went well, and, and the thing is, I need silk thread, and I have cotton thread, and I find this is, some of it is done, this is basically cotton thread right in here, and there's no sheen to it, so I had to add some gold in here just to give it the, a bit of a sheen, because it's, it's flat. This other material, or this other thread, it is a silk thread, but it's for crueling and for you know, for other kind of needlework. It wasn't, I don't think they used it for embroidery like I'm using it. But I like the sheen of it because it is like silk. And I haven't been anywhere to pick up my silk thread. And it's not easy to find. You go to any fabric store and they don't have it. So I just happened to get it in uh, BC when I was there where I first spied it. But now, I think there is silk thread in the spool that you can use on your sewing machine. So I was going to check that out and see if even if I can double that, then that would give us this, you know, this, this look. A seasoned embroiderer, Marge offers her suggestions for preparing embroidery materials and working with needles and rayon threads. And these little, um, they come in, these are called skeins, okay? And um, we have to take them apart and, and we have to put them on a roll. So I'll just take one apart here and then we'll have to roll it after, but they, they do come apart. The thing you have to remember is um, this little paper that's on there tells you the number. So if you want to uh, get the same color again, uh, which is important as if you're doing a, you know, your project. So. Uh, once you get the, your design picked out, then you look at the color. When you go and purchase your color, make sure that you get enough to do the whole project. You know, try and get as much as you can to finish project. Now when I open this up, you can see it's just kind of a mess um, if I let it go because it, it just really lets loose. So what you do is you try and find the end of it and um, you just unravel it very nicely. I'm just going to wrap this around and we start getting that thread in there. 
we just wrap this around nicely. Because you don't dare leave this very long because it's, it just knots up on you. And I know, I hope I'm not discouraging when I say that this is hard thread to work with, but um, you'll get used to it. Start out maybe with using the 100% cotton. It's, um, it's not as hard to, to work with. There's always little ends left over, but they're short and you can't, you know, you think, oh, well, I'll save them because I just may need, you know, a little piece on a, on a leaf or that and so I save all my ends too and I have my dear mother comes over and she rolls them all up in little parcels for me like she just likes rolling everything up fixes all my sewing boxes up you notice this thread it does not easily and it's you just have to be always trying to keep it tame it down a little bit and let it unravel itself because after a while it'll twist and, and you need to just let your needle fall. I just usually let my needle fall and it'll twirl a little ways and let it just until the twisting comes out. We were talking about doing uh, authentic uh, Métis, <laughs> Métis designs and trying to use the authentic Métis um, uh, silk thread because that's what the earlier ladies used was 100% um, silk because they were transported across uh, from Europe over to uh, to this country and of course the ladies got the best quality you know trading with them um, with the traders but now we're not so fortunate silk thread is is really hard to find and uh, we've had to go to uh, rayon so this is what we're using here it's not a silk, it's 100% rayon, but it's, you know, it's shiny, it has a sheen to it. Compared to the other one, it's, uh, you know, it's a lot nicer. But the other stuff is easier to work with. This this is pretty hard to work with. I've worked with silk before too, and it, it is, because it's so fine, it has a tendency to roll on you, so you really have to be working small areas with it. So now all we can get is the 100% rayon. So we're quite fortunate that we have such a nice assortment of colors here because um, I've been reading books on silk material or silk threads and there's usually just a black and a white, uh, what they're saying. And uh, so we're quite fortunate to be able to get rayon. So that's what we're gonna be using today and we'll use 100% cotton as well just to show you the different uh, textures that you can acquire with them. Once you get your, your scissors together and then you choose a, a needle to the texture that we're going to be working with and we're going to be working with 100% um, rayon silk so um, you need a pretty big eye to start out with okay for, for beginners I think we'll just really start out that way. This is what we hope to accomplish. There's going to be a few, um, just you know, a few stitches on there, not so many to start off with. Our basic one is, uh, I want you to learn the, the blanket stitch, and that's this outlying one. And it's, well, it's going to be the main stitch for this, for this bag. We'll talk a little bit about needles too, because it's important. Um, uh, the finer, as you notice, the needles, there's, there's quite a variety of, of uh, lengths and a variety of eyes, they call them, and um, which means the different sizes to what you're working with. So for here, we're working with the felt, which is a very easy material to go through, so we don't have to go too, too big, but we need to have a nice eye on there so that our thread goes through and we can thread it without too much difficulty. When you're working with your linen and that, you want a very sharp needle, but very fine, that right? you're going in and out pretty easy. There's a lot of other things yet, but we'll... The other thing, maybe, if you want to... Uh, there's some thimbles there. If you want to just pick a thimble up, Kim. Remember? Pick one of those thimbles. Yeah. <laughs> and you see, 
uh, there's a lot of things to work with and you, you know you get your needle threaded up and then you have to put your thimble on your finger so that you, you can push this you know pretty easy through and that's just how you do it you just push it through like that but I don't use a thimble usually <laughs> okay we're threaded up as you can see you have to keep pulling it out because it is it has a tendency to pull now I've been sewing without putting knots in, so it's going to take me a minute to make sure that I get a knot in. And that's something that I will show you as we go along, that you try not to have knots <laughs> in your work. We want a, we want a single, a single um, so you're going to have your thread short on one side, on the other, yeah, not too, too short so that you, you lose your stitch. But like that, yeah. Put a knot at the end of it. Okay. But usually when you're working with them, um, you can go between the material, you know, just find ways to hide your knot. You make a knot uh, a few inches away and pull it through when the knot is lost in the, in the fabric. So you make an actual knot mm -hmm. or just sew around and around? Well, you can sew around uh, and then knot and then pull it through after okay. so the knot sort of gets hid underneath. And it's good to have good lighting, try and have the light coming behind you and uh, so that you have a good work area, good lit area. I, I like working with natural light so I tend to see to be by the, by the window a lot. And of course, there's static to it because there's so much, you know, there is rayon in it. And um, it's, but it washes very good. I, uh, the one project there, I washed that whole thing there to see if I was any color dyeing. There's no color coming out at all. And that's exactly the, how it came out. And that's just with cold water and, you know, just a, a rinse. And you don't wring it, you lay between the towel and let the towel roll and you roll it out. and try not to crush your material too much. Three common stitches used in embroidery are the satin stitch, the buttonhole stitch, and the stem stitch. The satin stitch is a smooth, simple stitch that is made by piercing the fabric from the underside, carrying the thread across the top of the fabric, piercing the fabric from the top, and anchoring the stitch on the underside. It is commonly used to fill in large areas. The satin stitch is, is, is like just a fill-in stitch, actually. This is pretty big here, but I'll, I'm going to try. It's the same, the same as the other. What I usually do is I go around the edge, just on a regular you know, stitch, uh, and then you, you satin back and forth. I'll do it just from here, which is the same thing as your as, as our, uh, our buttonhole stitch, but um, I don't, I don't loop it. And so the statin stitch is more or less just a filling. Um, just back and forth. What you can do is put a few seed stitches in there just to fill it in and then come over it. I like to, when I do monograms, you, you like to do that a little bit. Now, when you're filling in, you've got to keep your thread down. This one has to be down. Uh, when you're, when I'm doing the, the blanket stitch, I'm going the other way, and so I'm getting in my road. I'm picking that darn stitch every time. And that's what happens when you get used to doing the stitching. I have a tendency to continue. And you just sort of curve as you go, uh, moving it just a smidgen over each time to make a curve so that. It's not too, too noticeable, so it's pretty clear there. I mean, it's
The buttonhole or blanket stitch is a reinforcing stitch often used to secure the cut edges of a woven material to prevent unraveling. Although normally used for its function, the buttonhole stitch, when used in Métis silk embroidery, is purely decorative. With the buttonhole stitch, the pattern is defined by the backbone of the stitch. The backbone is normally on the outer edge of the stitch and is created when the thread is looped under the point of the needle to form half stitches. Okay, we're going to start out with our first stitch and our first stitch is going to be underneath because we have a knot, right? So we, we don't want people to see our knot. So we're going to just make a stitch, stick your needle right underneath so that your, your knot is in between the material. You're always holding your thread up this way. Okay, always keep it in your finger over this way, away from your work, so that when you come back, when you come back through, now we're, we're this is going to be our first stitch, so it's going to be a little, a little awkward, I think, the first one, because you're, um, you're coming all the way along, and you're going to go through that opening, okay? Because we want that kind of an idea to the front on this one. Just keep going on the front. Yep, just keep it going. Looking as you go. So we're just going to go all the way around. That stitch is called the blanket stitch. I'm just going to go around the outer circle and I'll, I'll um, show you what I do. I usually start out this way so that my uh, stitching just comes like that because this is a piece that you don't want to have any knots in the back so you're not going to, you're not going to have any knots. You don't want any knots. So I'm just going to leave that like that and I'll move up my material like this. So I'm going to go down to about, say about here, and you see my center is going to be there. So actually I should be making a stitch about like that. Maybe that's what I'll do then. I'll just show you how wide you can spin this stitch. So we start out like this, and we continue on. But we have to be very, very close to that. You can see our centers coming. And as my eyes get worse, then I... You can see how this thread sometimes spins. So you have to make sure that it's all right. With a fine um, needle, it works out very nicely. Then you just keep moving along always coming out from the center of that, of that, um, doesn't always have to go into the same hole, just as long as it's, it's turning with it as you need. But this is a blanket, it's pretty well the same blanket stitch that you were using on the, on the other. You can always make a flower like this in, in your purse as well. Just to, sometimes you don't get close, but don't worry about it. When you're starting out, don't really worry if it's exactly, exactly because you're you're getting the feel of it and you're enjoying it. And then the next time when you do another one, you're just going to be surprising yourself because you're just right close together. But that gives you an idea how we are coming on the circle of this. going to leave that one now and that just gives you an idea of how how to start the center of your of your fabric. Because there's a corner there I'm going to go right into that same hole that I came out of there and to try and um, bring that to the tip of the of the point so that it's not 
I'm just trying to keep it right there if we can. That way then it finishes that corner. And the same thing for the next one. Just to keep the corner neat. have to have every stitch perfect. Today we're not looking at uh, anything but just getting the stitch down and getting your fingers around it and working with the needle and this type of thread. And that itself is, is a feat, I tell you. But it's inspiring, isn't it, to look at all these colors and uh, right away you pick your favorite color and you design something right there by just picking the color that you like. And we all have favorite colors. But that's pretty well the um Button hole stitch can be done very, very close together and surrounding. You can see it. And, uh, everything done on the same, the same kind of stitch is what they would say. Uh, then you can see here we moved into the just an outline, the same kind of thing, filling in. This is a another just a, a small fill in. This is a stem stitch which I think is what you're going to start next on yeah. uh, to make your leaves or your, your ivy. The stem stitch is a simple stitch used to make stems and vines and for outlining. So I'm going to do the stem stitch here and, um, and again we, we want to hide our stitches. So we always go backwards to our um, do our stitch and we're just going to do um, just a bit of a stem stitch here just in case. That way then I'm hiding my stitches or I'm hiding my ends. having these things up top because you're always catching your thread. They did a bit of a stem stitch here, they did a fill in satin stitch there, but this is just, uh, it's like a, a small satin stitch outlining the pattern. Made it very simple. Start out with something quite simple so that you finish it and uh, then you don't get yourself, you know, getting tired of it because if you do too much, put too much uh, design on your fabric, then you're you really have to get, maybe get tired of it and you know, not get back to it. So you want to always try and finish your, your project. Today, Mark continues to embroider and enjoys creating beautiful and decorative pieces. Through her embroidery, Mark incorporates many aspects of Métis culture, history and identity. It's our house at um, Katepwa, actually. 
and that was our house. We had a two-story house. We had a, a rose bush <laughs> beside our house, and that's mother out there with our cart, and we lived by the trees, and of course that's our hills, and uh, that's just how I pictured it. But that's how I would like our house to have looked. It didn't have the shutters and it didn't have that beautiful round door, you know, but you always picture it to be, we were one of the ones that had a, a wood house where the rest were a log. Yeah, so there's not a one down there, like now if you go down there, you, you see it's just um, totally, uh, it's, a, it's a resort now. Yeah, it's no place where you can go down, well you go to the boat launches and go down to the lake and just, because I used to look at right where Cookham's house was in our house. There's a great big beautiful place there now. Trees are gone. And yeah. Mark is only one of the many dedicated Métis women contributing to this vibrant art form. Each artisan brings a distinct but equally valid means of cultural expression to each piece they create. The end result of these activities is the preservation of traditional Métis culture. It's been exciting to be able to present these, uh, some of the work that my aunts have done, um, some of the work my mother has done as well. We gave it away most of the, you know, most of the things that we have done through the years, so we don't have a lot on hand, but I'm sure we're going to, we are going to now with, you know, the new enthusiasm about it, and new interest that we're going to be presented to. I wish um, everyone that starts, um, a project, the best of, you know, of luck, and I hope you enjoy it.